Hey, welcome to the Stink Truth Podcast. Alongside Mike Evans, I am Mark Schler. Thank you so much for subscribing. We have grown. Uh, we appreciate you for that. Also, drop us a question, and uh, we will try to get back to you on that. I've been doing that a lot lately, so uh, kind of interacting with folks. So make sure you subscribe. Give us a question. We'll get to you. Mike, how are you, buddy? I'm fired up. I, can we just jump right into this? Yeah, sure. Because I, I got to talk about Caleb Williams' pro day yesterday. <laughs> Holy smoke. Did you see some of the You're, balls he was are you, throwing? Are you? I like, I, was one of those like, I, I mean, he threw, <laughs> it looked like it was like 80 yards, a dime. You're, I, you're trying to instigate me, right? No, I, that was, I understand why the dude is like, you can just tell. The pro days might be the dumbest thing oh, geez. I have ever, I've ever, oh, Man, oh man, oh man, did you see Caleb Williams? I mean, he dropped back in shorts and a t shirt and he threw a 70 yard dot. That's what I heard yesterday. You want to see a dot? Let me bend over and grab my ankles. I'll show you a dot. <laughs> I just, like, I am, I'm dead serious. I like, how, like, that has nothing to do with your ability to play football. I don't understand how we get so enamored. You know what it is? You know what it is, honestly. It's a bunch of guys that were scouts or GMs that weren't athletes that wanted so badly to be athletes that they, I mean, they just get enamored with athleticism. What do I tell you all the time on our radio show? I tell you this all the time. Football is easy for football players. It is hard for athletes. Like I want football players. That doesn't tell me anything. Caleb, it tells me Caleb Williams got a big arm. Uh, well, I already knew that. We knew, we knew that. So if you can't have success on a pro day when everything is scripted, you've run through it six or seven times with the guys that you're throwing routes with. Like, I always get enamored by, he was, you know, I don't know what he was, but 58 of 62, and there were two drops. The guy was dead and almost perfect, you know? I mean, it just is like, Lord have mercy, you people are idiots. Idiots, I say. Sorry, I didn't hear a single thing after dot. <laughs> What, you want to see my dot? No, I don't want to see your dot. No, thank you. And I think I speak for everybody out there. We don't want to see. I've been lifting a lot, so there's some, there's some speed bumps in my dot. <laughs> Preparation H. Oh Go get yourself some. Oh, my God. How do I rescue this thing? Um, you and I were talking but about. But you know what? You understand no, I, I, what no, I, I, I was being sarcastic yeah. at the beginning because it's. Well, then what, all right, what, is, what is the value of. A pro day, then. There, there's got to be something. Is there anything? Oh, like you, you don't see any value at all in a pro day. Well, you get to go what? You get to go prod him and pro poke him, and you get to go look at him, or or what? Like, I, I guess you do see how they handle some kind of pressure, right? Because there's everyone's there they're huddled right around you it's all kind of clustered representatives from every single team so i guess there is a little bit of pressure to see how you handle it like i you, yeah i get no, I, I like i tried so yeah so here's the hypocrisy if if we want to talk about being a hypocrite uh, showing up to other people's pro days and working out and just killing the workouts Essentially put me on the map. Yeah, it's a great story. Go ahead, tell us. Yeah, so, I mean, I showed up to my teammate Marvin Washington's workouts. He invited me to his workouts, crushed him. I don't play in the NFL if it's not for Marvin Washington. Because he was a defensive guy, and he needed an offensive guy to, what, no, show that? He, no, it, it wasn't even that. There was only one There was only one team. This is so typical. All right, so I, I've never told you this. There was only one team. So I would show up to his workouts, introduce myself to the scouts, and basically say, hey, listen, um, you know, I played here. I played offensive line here. Um, I'm a like I'm a good player. I, I I played a lot of different positions. I got hurt a lot, but I had I got through the season healthy, and I just love the opportunity to work out for you guys, right? And so, most of the scouts would be like, sure, why not? We're working on him out. It's not going to hurt us to have two guys run a forty. Like, what the hell's the difference, right? Two guys to do the you know, the, the shuttle test. So we're really just running and jumping and benching and doing all that kind of stuff for the most part. So um, Marvin invited me to six, seven of his workouts, and um, I showed up and kicked his ass and everything, Marvin will tell you, and ultimately put me on the map. 
And the, the irony of it is, and here's, here's what needs to happen. The workout is nothing more than assessment of athleticism. That's it. It doesn't say whether you can play or not. But because my athleticism was such, it made scouts go up and watch my film. And when they watched my film, they were like, oh, shit, this guy can play. That was the difference. So Marvin did that for me. But there was one team. Like, I'm going to just tell you what happened, and then you tell me you guessed the team. Okay. All right. All right. So there was one team <laughs> that was really high on Marvin, and Marvin was supposed to be a second, third-round pick somewhere there. He ended up going in the sixth round. And I always joke with him. I was like – you went in the sixth round because I whipped your ass in all those workouts, right? <laughs> yeah. And they they, they downgraded yeah, I, you after yeah. that. So <laughs> I cost you so, four rounds. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so one team came to work him out, and they were working him out specifically as as a uh, you know as a defensive end. And so I introduced myself to the team and asked you know if I could work out. Everybody else was enthusiastic. All these other teams were enthusiastic. Yeah, absolutely. He'll work out like we'd love to, you know, we'd love to see it. This team was like, they were like, ha, huh, I guess you're a friend of Marvin's, right? And the, like, right. So they were just using me. They had no, in, they, they didn't care. It didn't matter. They were just there for Marvin. And so, like I said, every other team did this, like did their due diligence. And when I ran like a, you know, I'm, I'm like 280. And I'm running four seven two, you know, or four seven six. Right. I'm I'm putting up ridiculous, and they're held ha handheld times, but they're ridiculous times, right? I, I mean, I did more on the bench press test in college than anybody at the combine this year did, you know. I, so it was it was ridiculous stuff, and and um, and this team has no intention. They don't care. They're just there to work out Marvin. So then they asked me to play dummy, like blocking dummy. And to take sets and stuff. And so, of course, you know, me being the snarky ass that I am, <laughs> I, I recognize right off the bat that they have no interest in me. No interest. So they're saying, hey, take this set. Marvin's going to pass rush on you, right? So I take the set. Marvin, you know, hand swipes and goes around me. And they're all, like, watching Marvin. I go, and I just started going, hey, 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 how was that set? Did you see that set? Did you, you watch it? Okay, but make sure you watch it this time. Watch uh -huh. it. And I would just, every time we'd do a drill, I would go to one of their scouts and go, what'd you think about, like, what my stuff? You're, just, not being, you're just being a dick. Right. They're not paying any attention. <laughs> so I'm just bothering yeah, these guys. Right. Anyhow, that was, the, that was the only team that when I worked out at Marvin's workout, that was the only team that didn't take me seriously or didn't pay any attention to the times or anything I posted. Yes. Cincinnati Bengals. No, the Cincinnati Bengals were super high on me. Oh. Super high. That Jim McNally was their old line coach. I'm gonna say and he always called me the one that got away because he tried to call he tried to draft me in the second round. Like he was really oh dude, he called me every single round. I'm standing on the table for you. I'm standing yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim McNally, what round great guy. You win in the twelfth, right? Don't even try to get me. <laughs> Don't even try. <laughs> and you know you're trying to get me on a really. I got you on that yeah, one okay. before. A tenth rounder. Tenth rounder. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, no. Jets. It was the New York Jets. Jets, <laughs> Jets going to Jets. The Jets that, are going to Jets. That's why. That's why. You are a Jets fan. Right, exactly. That's why you're cursed. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, just to kind of put a wrap on, because uh -huh. I love the Marvin Washington story. And you paid it forward later in yeah. your career and his career. Yeah, later in my career, um, I got done. We we just won Super Bowl thirty two, and um, I'm in the training room. You know that's I'm I'm sure I had some surgery or whatever. I'm wrapped in ice, and Shanahan comes down to me and said, uh, "Hey, dude, I I need to ask you a question." And at this point, I'd probably played eight nine years in the league, whatever it was, and um, he goes, "Hey, man, uh, we need a rotational piece on our defense, a rotational a guy that can play D tackle, D end, da da da." He goes, you've been in the league for a long time. You've played against all these guys. I don't really know these guys as guys. You know, I've got my evaluation of each guy. But he said, ultimately, it doesn't really matter as long as the guy fits kind of our culture and our football team. And I said, all right, well, let me see the list. And he gives me the list. And my eyes, just, I just kind of peruse the list. And right there, Marvin Washington. I said, sign, sign Marvin. 
And so he goes, done. So he goes up to his office. Next thing you know, Marvin's part of our team. And uh, Marvin and I won Super Bowl 33 together. That's awesome. So the that Vandals, the Vandal that got me yep. in the National I don't play in the National Football League if it's not for Marvin Washington. And Dirty Wash doesn't get a Super Bowl ring if it's not for me. And that's how many years later? Like That was uh, like uh, ten, eight, 10 years nine, later. Yeah, eight that's years awesome. later. That is like that. full yeah. circle right yeah, there. Yeah, right? That is full circle. Pretty cool. Uh, um, well, so basically you were like an assistant GM. For Mike Shanahan at that yes, point. Yes, that's uh, since, uh, yeah. And and I sometimes, and I don't, and I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of fans out there that think the same thing. I I totally feel this way. So you and I, we've been doing our, this show in Denver, uh-huh. and ever since the Broncos won their Super Bowl in in 2015, Super Bowl 50, and we've had all the 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 down years since then. I am convinced that if I had been the general manager of the Denver Broncos this entire time, they'd be a playoff team. Yeah. Right now, no, I don't. I have, I, don't, I, have, I have no doubts. I don't think there's. I don't think there's any question. I don't like. So, like, if you and I worked together these last eight years as as running the Broncos, no question. I, no, I, there's. I, I totally agree with there you. There is zero question. I have zero doubts. I look at some of the moves made, and I'm like, why? Like, why would you do? For instance, I'll give you a for instance. Okay, a guy that's never had a thousand yard season. A guy that's been injured almost every year that he's played, a guy that has averaged two and a half touchdowns per year. You trade for a fifth and sixth round pick. I'm talking about Jerry Judy, and then you pay him a fifty-eight million dollar contract with forty-one million dollars guaranteed when he still has the option year. Why? Like, why would you do that? And and again. It's based on talent because there's no question, very much like the the pro days we just talked about, there is no question athletically that guy's one of the most talented players in football. Well, what, all of a sudden that all of a sudden that he's going to take responsibility for where he is right now in his career, that he was a first-round bust for the Denver Broncos, and now he's going to take responsibility <laughs> after you pay him? Like, seriously, what like what could you possibly be thinking? Why would you make that move? Why would you think that it's a good idea to sink $41 million guaranteed into that guy? Now, I get it if he comes out in the first seven weeks of the season, he balls out of control, and you say, let's lock him up to a long-term deal. Great, because he's got that kind of talent, Mike. Mm -hmm. He's just never been that kind of player. What's going to happen if all of a sudden he starts off the season kind of slow and you're asking him to run block and to do some things because you guys are beasts up front. Like, what's going to happen then? Did you just say balls out? Yeah. Isn't that a term you hate? Yeah, I do hate you balls hate that. out. Whenever I, I brought that up. I on, hate it when you say yeah, it. Yeah, because if or I say when a player yeah, says it. Like, hey, he's, he's, he's kind of balling, balling out. He's balling out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a term that I normally don't <laughs> I don't. You just like. used it. Why do you not like it so much? Well, because I, normally I hear it when I hear a player go, "I'm just gonna go out there and ball." That's what really bothers me. Is if I'm just gonna go out there and ball it means I'm not actually studying. I'm not, I'm not really uh, like I always say. Just because you play a pro sport doesn't make you a professional, right? You, you're like if you just say, "Man, I just go out and ball," it means you don't study, <laughs> and that irritates me. That's why. <laughs> That's but why. if he does, if he goes out and is is crazy good, yeah. And he's the focal point of your offense. Yeah, then revisit it. And then just go, and then walk up to his agent and go, dude, we want to lock him up long term. Right. What's it going to hurt you to wait and see if he produces? Like, that's what, that. and I'll give you credit, dude. When they signed Russell Wilson here, you were one of the very few people in this town that was like, why would you sign him right now? Let's just wait. Hey, two wait years left a year. on the deal. Yeah. Yeah, he's just kicking into the contract yep. extension he's going to get 38 million dollars paid by the broncos and 1.2 million dollars paid by the the steelers like he's getting that he's just dipping into that extension you signed him to two years ago like why did you do it at that point you didn't need to so russ now a steeler and you can tell he's out from underneath the thumb mm-hmm of Sean Payton. Right. Because last year Sean Payton took over and said, We need more anonymous donors yeah. around here. And, and quit running for governor and quit and, kissing babies. And, yeah. And, and so all the offseason 
workout videos yeah. that Russ liked to put out suddenly went away. Yeah. He's back, baby. Did you see the oh, Russ yeah. workout video? Yeah. It just is like and the Rusties. I mean, I don't know how you guys do it. I really don't. I don't know how you you stay on board with it. It was like there was there was like in the in the Russ video, okay, the the Russ my workout video. Look how hard I'm working, everybody. Woo, it's gonna the best is yet to come. <laughs> um but it, there was there was one thing that was entirely true based upon what I saw in that video and one thing that was patently false, okay? So the one thing that was true is that he scrambled around inside the pocket, up and down, in and out, up and down, and then he finally threw it, and it was about 7.6 seconds worth of time before he threw it. That's 100% true. Nobody holds the ball longer than that dude. That dude will hold the ball and take sacks like nobody's business, like it's his job. Okay, so that part was true. The part that was false was he was actually throwing the ball from the pocket. Come on, everybody knows they didn't throw the ball from the pocket. He uh, scrambles out, takes sacks. You know, he escapes the outside of the pocket. Like, I, I just was like, do, do we really need to see how hard you're working? Do we really need to see what great shape you're in? Do we really – like, who are you trying to sell? And by the, the way – Rusties? Is it – because is is this just blissful, uh, I guess, ignorance on the part of him and his team that they put this video out on the same day that Caleb Williams is doing his pro day? Because oh. there's a part of me that's kind of like trying to grab his share of the spotlight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Trying to get you, his shine a little like bit. You think it's calculated? Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? I think his team calculates everything. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, don't forget about my pro day. <laughs> <laughs> what a nerd. Jeez. What a nerd. See, this is the kind of stuff, folks, that... Th- so we have affectionately mm-hmm. labeled a, a group of, of fans out there as Rusties. Yeah. You're kind of on the whole Swifties thing. Uh-huh. Rusties. And, yeah. And you've had your battle with Rusties, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all... Because they, they love to come after Sean Payton. Oh, I, Yeah. Sean, they, they do love to come after Sean Payton. They go after him. Like, I saw so many. Some of you people are so stupid. Like, I saw so many of you on social media. It just blows me away. Like, nobody's going to play for Sean Payton. He did Russell wrong, and he asked him to, you know, he asked him to waive his injury clause, and nobody will come back. Everybody hates Sean Payton. He's a tyrant. What a dick. You know? And meanwhile... Not one, but two players signed, con- agreed to contracts with other teams, and then Sean gave him a call and said, hey, man, I'd really like you to stay here. Okay, Sean, we'll do that. Thanks. Like, Will boy, Lutz, I really affected. Will Lutz, the kicker, yeah. uh, went to went to Jacksonville, changed his mind, came back. Justin Sternad, a, a special teams guy, uh, agreed with Carolina. And, and came back. Came back. Do you really think? By the way, when you were just doing that, you were really giving off like a real like Chris Farley type vibe. Oh, right was there. that? Yeah. Like, <laughs> but do you really think? <laughs> just, you really think if players hated Sean? By the way, the other thing is there's there's like six former Saints that signed here. So if Sean Payton is such a tyrant and he's trying to sabotage people's careers and he's just a dick and he's you know he's messing with people's money so do you think people would be so inclined that formerly played for him to come back to play for him do you, do you really think like do you, you use any common sense or any logic whatsoever when you make claims about you know what a tyrant what a tyrannical rule Sean Payton has over the Denver Broncos. Do you, do you think about it at all before you say it? Well, he definitely has a, the kind of personality, and he's very he's he's very direct, and and there's a certain swagger slash oh, he's a jerk arrogance now. that he yeah, has. Oh yeah, and he can be a jerk. Yeah, there's he no can, question. But I, I I I noticed right from the start that you could tell he was a Bill Parcells disciple. I I see and hear a lot. Of Parcells, sure. In Sean Payton, and he's constantly re- referencing uh, uh, Bill Parcells, but it, it just makes for a real interesting AFC West because now you got you got Sean Payton, and then you got the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, personality-wise, Jim Harbaugh. Mm-hmm. So, did you see that what Harbaugh <laughs> did on his way out of Michigan? Yeah, I he did. had a yard sale. <laughs> Stink, Jim Harbaugh as public a figure uh-huh. as you're going to get. 
invited people to come by his home and go through his stuff in a, at a yard sale. Right. Is that the most uh, Jim Harbaugh uh, thing ever? It, it, it is. And, and I love him for it, by the way. But, but I'm fascinated by what Jim Harbaugh collected and what was for sale. Like, like what would, like, you could get a, here's a whole, you know, stack of khaki pants. Oh, I would love like, to get some of his khaki pants. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't. Why not? <laughs> right. But I just, yeah, you know who, you know who did that all the time back in the, remember Bud Grant? Bud Grant. I do. You might need yeah. to explain to some of our so, younger so viewers. Bud Grant was the coach of the Minnesota Vikings all through the 70s, went to four Super Bowls. Um, you know, head coach, legendary, just passed away a year ago or so, but legendary guy. When I do a Minnesota game, when I do a Vikings game, so his office is still, they've got it like preserved, you know, behind glass, but it's a, but it's kind of a showpiece, but it was also his office still. And when I was there, Bud Grant was there a bunch. Like he's, he was there all the time. You know, he had kind of a meritous status, um, legendary coach. He used to have garage sales like every weekend. Like he would have a uh, yeah, and and he'd have like, you know, former autograph pictures of Fran Tarkin. He'd be selling, and, you know, all kinds of all kinds of memorabilia and stuff. He'd be getting out of his house. He did it forever. Bud Grant was famous for back in the day when Minnesota football fans were actually tough, and you'd have to go to games outside at the old uh, Met. Yeah, um, he was famous for it'd be like just frigid, and he'd be out there and. Short sleeves. Yeah. Bud he, Grant. They they, they, they don't like, make them like that they anymore. Broke the mold. By the way, their new stadium though is beautiful. That thing is that thing's gorgeous. Yeah, well, Minnesota fans need a dome stadium now. Amen. Not as tough as in they, Minnesota. Uh, hey, used anytime to be. I'm broadcasting in Minnesota, I'm glad there's a dome stadium. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know. I say, it's right. easy for me to say that, but right. uh, no, I'm I hey, you could, I'd like I wish they build one here in Denver. Same uh, same exact reason. You ready to get some questions from the listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here we go. Um this is from John. Mark um JJ McCarthy, can you explain the infatuation with J.J. McCarthy, because when I look at his stats, they don't jump out at me. Yeah, I can, I can, because he actually is probably the one guy in this draft that runs the most pro-style offense, and therefore you have to imagine that J.J. McCarthy, um, you know, I'm talking about, I'm talking about changing personnel groups, you know, running the football, um, you know, changing the strength and motioning and, and, you know, and doing all that pre-snap stuff, uh, calling plays in the huddle. Like, there's a lot of guys that get to the NFL that have never called a play in the huddle. You do yourself a favor, man. Go back, like, just Google this. If You guys get a minute. Go to YouTube, and it's Chris Sims trying to spit out a play call in the huddle when he first got to Tampa Bay with John Gruden. And I mean, he can't. He it's like four different mistakes, and there is so much to know from a formational standpoint and all this stuff. So when you get into a formation, you know you got to know, hey man, if we're shifting or if we're fly, you know, if we're flying the trips right, and are we in twelve personnel or eleven personnel, and where does that guy start and where does he finish? So I know where he starts, but I know what the finishing formation. And oftentimes what you'll see is if we're in a fly to some, like fly to trips right, say, like fly to trips right nasty. So we're going to start in a stack, right, north or south, and then we're going to fly across and we're getting to trips. But if we're short on time on the clock, I'm just going to, I'm going to excommunicate the fly. And I'm going to say, no, just line up over there. Like to do all that stuff pre-snap, to understand the clock and the timing and all that stuff, like, nobody does that. And so J.J. actually operates like a real pro-style offense. So from a learning curve standpoint, you're like, well, he's already done this under Jim Harbaugh. So he's the most versed at not only the pre-snap stuff, but also the also the progression-style offense that, that we all run in the NFL, that very few run in college football. Right. He has gone through progressions which most guys is going to be new to them. So I guess to kind of boil it down because, you know, for a lot of people who are looking at these college prospects, you, you do tend to look at the numbers. You're not really interested in a guy's stats as much as you are just 
eye test, what what transferable NFL yeah. skills or already pro readiness mm-hmm. do you see in a quarterback? You're not necessarily interested in the numbers as much. No, I'm not. I'm inter- I'm interested in does a guy get through progressions? Does a guy actually understand? You know, changing the formation, changing the strength. You know, operating kind of more. That's the problem with college football. Is it? You know, it just isn't. It doesn't. It's not very transferable. The quarterback position is not very transferable. Um, you know, I keep hearing like our buddy Joel Klatt. Mm-hmm. Joel Klatt for Fox, phenomenal. The lead, the lead broadcaster, college football guy is great. He was talking about. I don't own, understand in his podcast why Drake May is dropping. Like, and he talked about he talked about potential and his big you know big throws over the top and his athleticism and and how like his skill set from that standpoint is just extreme. Like it, and my experience in the NFL is that doesn't win you football games. I always have this 70-30 rule that I talk about all the time. Like 70% of the time, we better be on schedule if we're not, we're in trouble. You know, 30% of the time, hey, things break down, you got to go make a play, right? But I want your default mechanism as a quarterback to be from your neck up, not from your neck down. So I want you to be able to make plays with your mind as opposed to your body. And the most reliable thing at the quarterback position, in my opinion, is being able to execute the boring. I need a guy that can execute the boring, not a guy that can flash. Like if you if you're operating instead of 70-30, if you're operating 50-50, you're losing. Because more bad things are going to happen to you than good things. That's that's my issue. Uh, another question from one of our, our great viewers out there. What was your reaction to Deion Sanders coming out and saying that if his son Shador was in this year's draft, he'd be the second quarterback taken? I'm, only behind yeah. Caleb Williams, yeah. ahead of Drake May, Jaden Daniels, JJ. McCarthy. Yeah, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that. Really, I don't. I don't doubt that. I haven't. I haven't studied Shador. I've watched some of his games. I mean, he, there's no question he's got, you know, athleticism and arm talent. Um, and the other thing is, I would imagine knowing Dion well, that um, his mentors and the people he has worked with are some of the best that have ever done yeah, it. He's worked with Brady. I mean, he's yeah, buddies yeah. with Brady. Yeah. Shador so, is. Yeah, so I, I would imagine that unlike a lot of college football players, he's more versed in, you know, the understanding of, regardless of the system he's been in, the understanding of routes and route progressions and throwing progressions. So I, 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 don't, I don't doubt that that he would be right up there at the top. Well, it explains a lot why some mock drafts, they always have mock drafts already for 2025, that right. has Shador Sanders as being the number one sure. uh, presumed pick, you know, as long as he goes out and has a good year this year for uh, the Buffs. Mm-hmm. Final question, I always love these really, you know, kind of inside football questions. Mark, is center an underrated position? What impact does a great center make and you as a left yeah. guard all those years you're very intimate with uh what a center does yeah you know i mean in my day a center would set the protection and then we could overrule it based upon you know kind of all went down um nowadays most of the quarterbacks set that which would would not fly with me if i was coaching i don't i don't need the quarterback i need our guys to understand and to set the rules of where we're going. Um, Because quarterbacks, you know, quarterbacks are just like, I want to switch it from, you know, let's call it 52 to 44. And so you walk up there and go, 52 is the mic, 52 is the mic, blue 80, blue 80, 44 is the mic, 44 is the mic. You know, and you're like, you know, you really, and now we're all edged and you're like, and he gets sacked and you're pissed at us. No, you're the dumbass that switched it and didn't give us time to communicate it, right? You see it all. I see it all the time. All so an offensive, if if it was left to you guys, not only does the correct change get made, but done so in a time in which the offensive linemen now have a chance to really yeah, a, get a, locked in in a timely fashion. Yeah, Philip Rivers was the worst. He used to do it all the time. Drove me crazy. I knew a couple coaches that coached on the staff. <laughs> You can go crazy about it, but, um, but yeah, like I just, I just think 
I would like to take it off the quarterback's plate. As a matter of fact, you know, one of the things that Jason Kelsey probably doesn't get enough credit for, Jason Kelsey said everything in Philadelphia, especially for a young quarterback when Jalen Hurts first came in. That was not on Jalen Hurts' plate. I, he didn't have to know that. Yeah, you can see that, actually, when you watch Eagles games. Right. You can see how much so he's in control. Just take it off the quarterback's plate. Yeah. And let, so now the quarterback has to know when we designate a guy, you know, you have to understand if we're turning a certain way, you know, if we're turning three week and we designate a guy or even if we change a guy, then you have to know, hey, if the fourth guy comes weak, that that's my guy. Right. right? I've got to know that. So those are things that have to happen. But, yeah, good center. I mean, to be an anchor. The other thing is a lot of times what they try to do is they try to you know, the defenses will try to lock that guy up one-on-one, you know, against a guy who's a, a good pass rusher, and you're already at a disadvantage because you got to snap the ball. Mm-hmm. So what they'll do is they'll walk up linebackers or walk up, and they'll try to get that nose guard or that, you know, come into a nickel situation with a guy who can really pass rush and put him at the nose in a known passing situation and then walk other guys up so you have to go mingo man. Yeah. And then you're basically saying, hey, man, let's just lock the center up one-on-one and take advantage of that. So, yeah, it's a it's a vital, it's a really vital in uh, of it, you know, important position. So, by the way, really quick, you know, we were talking about being a GM. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the whole, I mean, Justin Fields, the market was set with Justin Fields, right? They got a six with a conditional, right. could be a fourth right. round pick, right. right? Why did you trade him? Like if you and I are going to be GMs, why did you trade him at, at when the market was already? Hey, we're not giving much market wise. Why did you get rid of him? Because I, the reason I tell you that is because come draft time, what what's going to happen in the draft? What do you think is going to happen? Quarterbacks that shouldn't be taken in the top ten are going to get elevated to the top ten, right? Right. right. So there's going to be a run on quarterbacks. Like a lot of people think four of the first four picks are going to be quarterbacks. Somebody's yep. moving up into Arizona spot. And if I was Arizona, do you really believe in Kyler Murray? Right. But like, there's going to be at least four quarterbacks taken, maybe the first four spots, where they're going to put push good football players back. Right. Really good football players back. Like if four quarterbacks are taken in the first four spots or the first six spots, say the Giants, if, if they, maybe right. it's Giants, whatever it is. I go, then there's, you know, then you got your choice between Bo Nix and, and Michael Penix. At that point, you know what's going to become more valuable? Justin Fields. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, now you're going to have some leverage. Or, last year, Flacco, Wilson. I mean, go through the, the backup quarterback. Rudolph. Yeah. Trubisky. Can we just keep going through Jake all? Browning. Jake Browning. Keep going. So, at some point, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when guys get hurt. At some point, somebody in training camp or somebody in the first week is going to get hurt. Does Justin Fields then all of a sudden become a more valuable commodity? And the answer is yes. So, why the hell do you trade a guy for a sixth rounder? Well, let me answer that. Yeah. And this is why we would be such good general managers. Because we wouldn't get caught up in the idea that we have to move Justin Fields out of Chicago because we don't want to cause any friction or any Mm -hmm. dreaded distractions for Caleb Williams. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we got to move Fields out because, you know, there still might be some people who are loyal to Fields and fans that believe Fields. Could be the answer and got a raw deal. So if Caleb Williams has a bad day of practice and throws a couple right. of picks, everyone's like, oh, hey, you know, what about no, Fields? He's looking over his shoulder. He can't. Yeah, so, well, I would so, get him an emotional uh, a support ferret, right? <laughs> I get you know, Caleb Williams needs an emotional support <laughs> ferret yeah. that he can snuggle up with. And when yeah. he throws a couple of picks, he can cry. He can put that ferret on his little shoulder and he can nestle his little head next to it and he can cry on, on this ferret. Do they have emotional support ferrets? Oh, I'm sure they got emotional support everything. But that's why you and I, let's just say if we were running an NFL team, we probably would not be big. Uh, we would not, the NFL PA would probably not be a big, like, friend of ours. Yeah. Because they'd be like, you're too mean to players, especially quarterbacks. <laughs> right. Quarterbacks need to be I propped would, up. I would be Quarterbacks, like, every other sport 
Every other position on the team, massive competition, right? Right. Except for quarterback. Quarterbacks, you got to make them comfortable. Yeah, I They don't. can't be looking over their shoulder. Yeah. That's why Justin Fields was traded. Because you're right. Otherwise, you make an argument that hold on to him. His value is only going to go up. His value is going to increase. Yeah. Come draft time, he'll, you'd gotten a third or a second maybe. But with a desperate quarterback team? Yeah. And the inevitable injuries you're talking about? Sure. Yeah. 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 Just stupid. That Again, why you and I are better GMs yeah. than all the GMs out there. Uh, We're available. We'll yes, just come get we us. We are available. We're yes. available. <laughs> Not really doing anything. <laughs> nope. <laughs> pretty my schedule's pretty empty. <laughs> yeah. Have you been watching this show? <laughs> <laughs> hey, for everybody involved in the Stink Truth Podcast, thank you so much for listening. And uh we'll be back with you guys next week. Hey, for everybody involved in the Stinky Truth, we thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please make sure you don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel for more content just like this. If you want to see more of our videos, you can also be sure to check out our playlist. Let us know exactly what you think in the comments below. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much for being a part of that. Don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video.